Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Uh, I've got a Dell G5 laptop here. Really nice machine this actually. Uh, i7 GTX something. Whatever. Very nice laptop. Uh, it does not turn on. Um, so this has got the classic Dell symptom of uh, the charger cuts out. So I'll show you what this looks like. Let's just travel over here. Here I have the charger for this. This is a 180 watt charger. So that's 19 and a half volts at 9.23 amps. And as you can see, we've got a green light on the charger there. So green light on the charger. And when I plug the charging cable in, oh heck, I need to adjust my screens. And if I plug the charger in, we go whack, and the light on the charger has gone out. And in order to make the charger light come back on again, I've got to unplug the charger. So disconnect it from the mains, wait a couple of seconds, plug it back in, and now the light has come back on. So as you can see, the charger is cutting out when we connect it to the laptop. So this is happening because there is a short circuit in the laptop. Um, the laptop has a short circuit in it, and I'm not sure if the charger detects this or if, I mean, the laptop can detect it, but I'm not sure if the charger detects it or whether it's happening via the sense pin on the charger. But either way, the charger realizes that there is a fault and switches off and needs to be reset. So to fix this problem, we need to have a look at the laptop. So what we are likely to find is when we get into the laptop, there's probably a short circuit across the DC jack. Um, there might be a short circuit on V main instead, but whatever. Let's open this up and look. So let's take the back cover off and see what we can get access to. I would like to get some motherboard access without having to fully strip it. Uh, oh yeah, we've got something here. The problem, the problem with gaming laptops like this is there's so much work to disassemble, and this is no exception. However, the DC jack comes in there. You can see we've got a DC cable coming across. So this gives me something to work with. Let's grab the multimeter. And I shall set it to continuity mode so it beeps when the uh, probes touch. And I'm going to put, let's see, I'm just going to poke in here and just peel back the black wire a little bit. Let's bring you guys in a bit closer. So let's just peel back just so we can have a look at the wire colors. There we go. So as you can see, we've got a bunch of red pins, a bunch of black pins, and a white sense pin. So I want black the ground the black probe on the black pins, which are ground, and red probe to one of the red pins. And we've got no beep. Let's check the actual resistance. So let's go to resistance mode. So ohms. And we've got like 230 kilo ohms, so lots and lots of ohms. So there's no short on the DC jack. So that means we're completely fine here. This also means that it's not going to be a reverse protection diode or something like that, because the reverse protection diode would be across this DC jack. So if it was something super easy like a bum diode, then we would be seeing short circuit there. Uh, the bad news is it probably means that um, we've got a short on the main power rail, and that could be a much bigger problem for a big gaming laptop like this. On a normal run-of-the-mill consumer laptop, well, sorry, not consumer laptop, but on a normal office laptop without a graphics card, that would be an easy one. But gaming laptops, when you have a short on the main power rail, it has a nasty habit of being a blown MOSFET somewhere or a short inside the board or something equally horrifying. Uh, either way, to get any further, I think we're going to have to actually disassemble the laptop. I haven't been counting, but this has been an absolutely unreasonable amount of screws to take off this back cover. Like, I mean, you don't need to take off the take out all these screws to get to all the important stuff, RAM, SSD, hard drive, battery, and stuff, but man, for servicing. Let's see. No, that guy doesn't need to come out. Good. Or not yet anyway. Okay. 
I think I can try and split the case now. There we go. These gaming laptops are not for the faint of heart if you're new to disassembly. This one's not the worst I've ever dealt with, uh, mainly because I knew kind of knew how to approach this one. Um, the main bit that catches you out is just uh, um, this bit that came off the back. If you know about that and you know how to remove it, the rest of it's not too big of a deal. But yeah, gaming laptops, not a good place to start with laptop repair. Right, what's coming out? Uh, everything's attached to the bottom. Okay, uh, fine. I think we've got to disconnect all of this. The motherboard feels like it's attached to the bottom of the laptop, which is quite uncommon for a modern design. How are we doing? Who's coming off? Who's going? Everyone? Everyone. All right. Eh. I mean, that's not terrible, come to think of it. Yeah, I'm okay with that, actually. Uh, initially, I'm just like, oh, gross, it's attached to the bottom. Why would you do that on a new laptop? But that was not too painful to disassemble, and now we've got access to the keyboard as well. Like, I don't need to replace the keyboard, but if I was doing a keyboard replacement, this would actually be not a big deal. So, yeah, a couple of screws to remove the uh, motherboard from the bottom case now. All right, are we moving? Okay, we're now bolted in via the fans. And I believe the fans are bolted in on both sides. This is definitely a laptop where you need to track the screws, so I'm putting all of these screws into distinct piles. Oh, I don't think that does need to come out, actually. I think we're moving. All right, what's holding me up? Something over on the right hand side is. Yep, we've got the screws on the Type C port. Let's have a look down here. And if you look super closely, hopefully it hasn't been mangled by compression, there's loads of tiny dots here. So those are vias, so that's where the path is going through the circuit board. And there's lots of those. So if we look on the other side of the board, we should see where those are coming out and hopefully we'll see where we're getting lost. So on the other side of the board, we've got this big black square of plastic covering some stuff. Let's just peel that back. Okay, well, there's our inrush limiter. This is what I was looking for. All right, so we need to do some back, uh, we need to do some back and front comparisons. So these vias are going through to the other side of the board and they're connecting to places. So we need to see how this is all linking up so we know where the power is coming from and where it's going to. So let's just do some comparisons. Right, so starting from here again, we've got these two groups of vias here, and oh, let me use a pointer that's useful. So starting from the top side of the board again, we've got this group of vias here and here, which correspond on the other side of the board to here and here. So this is our DC in connection here, and it's going through these tiny little inductors on both sides of the boards. Those inductors are there to smooth out incoming power. So if we connect up the charger jack and there's a slight spark or there's a dodgy connection where it's been worn out because of mechanical connection, uh, that will cause you know, ripples and bumps in the power. And those will get smoothed out by these guys. It just stops that sudden sort of that spark or jump or that rough connection from spiking or damaging anything. So they're getting smoothed out by those, and then they're going into these two MOSFETs. This is our inrush limiter. This is what I was looking for. So these two MOSFETs are essentially forming a digital switch, which allows the laptop's power management IC, which is probably this guy here, it allows this guy to switch off the incoming power. So if this guy goes, I don't like some, what's going on here, it switches off these MOSFETs and prevents power going into the laptop and that prevents any damage in a faulty situation. In this case, because the, in all probability, there is some kind of fault in here. This guy is detecting a fault and telling the charger to switch off to avoid killing something. 
So it's a good thing. So if we put our black probe onto a ground point, so I'm going to put go onto this screw hole down here. So the screw hole is grounded. This goes to basically all the negatives in the laptop for all intent and purpose. Um, so once again, our DC jack, not shorted. The input to the inrush limiter, not shorted. So now between the MOSFETs over here, not shorted. And then so we go in here and then into this one, then out of here and we're coming across underneath to here. And there's our short circuit. So this is the main current sense resistor. So this forms a bridge onto the main power rail in the laptop, which is this big trace coming all the way up through here and going off up here, going off the places in the laptop. Notice there's another group of vias here. So this big trace continues on the other side of the board to go to places as well. So that current sense resistor, that's going to have two wires going back to this chip here. And this is a R005 ohm. So that is uh, 0.005 of an ohm, if my uh, reading is correct. And that's a tiny, tiny amount of resistance, which has, has no impact of power going into the computer at all. But that will cause the tiniest of voltage drops. So we're talking like, um, you know, we've got 19 and a half volts coming in. It goes through that resistor and it will drop by like 0.001 of a volt or something completely irrelevant that the laptop does not mind. But this chip detects that slight drop in voltage. And the more power that goes through that resistor, the more that voltage will drop ever so slightly, which means this chip can detect how much power is flowing through the resistor. This is called a shunt resistor. So it basically means that this chip can detect power consumption of the laptop, so it knows how much power it's consuming, and it also knows if it's over power or if there's a short circuit and all kinds of stuff like that. So uh, this is our main entry point into the laptop and this is where we can detect our short from. And if we look at any other point on this power rail, so let's go all the way up to, let's go all the way up to here. So here's something else on that. Again, black probe on a screw hole, that's shorted. Those are shorted. Anything else on here will be shorted to ground. That's shorted. Back of these caps, shorted, all shorted. Everything on the main power rail is shorted. So we need to figure out why. Now, firstly, we need to check for a trap. I'm in continuity mode at the moment. So I'm in beep mode. So my multimeter just beeps on low resistance. Now, what I want to check is, do we have a dead short circuit or do we have low resistance? And I'll tell you why that's important in a sec. So I'm just going to go over to resistance mode and we're going to see what the actual resistance is. So from here, I'm going to go black probe on ground and back of the current sense resistor. Ah, I'm wandering off my ground point. All right, there we go. So we've got 0.6 ohms. That's great. That's less than one ohm. Less than one ohm to all intent and purpose is a dead short circuit. What I'm checking for is if we'd had, say, three ohms or something like that, three ohms is not a dead short. That's low resistance. I sometimes refer to it as low impedance. However, that's a very, there's a lot of arguments over low impedance generally applies to AC. So just to keep everyone happy, I'll just call it low resistance. Now, the big ICs on the board, like the CPU and the GPU, uh, not necessarily in that order. No, that's the CPU, that's the GPU, yeah. Um, these will have a very, very low internal resistance. And if one of the MOSFETs feeding power into them had gone dead short circuit, the short circuit that we'd see is from ground, through the chip, through the shorted MOSFET, and onto the main power rail. Now, what that means is that the short circuit is through the chip and that is bad we don't want to inject power there because we might kill that chip although if it's shorted already it might already be dead 
So we want to make sure that we've ch we've checked for short low resistance and we've not seen any low resistance. So at this point, although we'll check again, we can reasonably believe that our CPU and our GPU are probably okay. However, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove the um, uh, the heatsink and we're going to do a physical inspection of the board to see if we can see any craters or anything that's gone bang. Okay, this guy's going to be super sticky because it's got loads of thermal pads and stuff on it as well. So I'm just going to gently, going to give it a bit of a wiggle. Just gently ease all that off. There we go. And off it comes. Yeah. There we go. Right, uh, most of our thermal pads have come off, which is great. These guys stay, stayed on, so I'm just going to very carefully peel these guys back and reapply them to the heat sink. Ah! I hate thermal pads. Oh no, oh it's stuck to itself. We're okay, we're okay. Alright, we're free. And I'll just pop out these memory modules as well. That's a pair of eight gigabyte modules. Right, now let's have a close up down here because if anything has gone bang, it'll be around here somewhere because this is all the high power stuff. And I'm gonna go in super close and I'm gonna be very careful. I'm really bad at spotting things by eye. Um, like the past couple of bought the past couple of times I've had a f visible physical damage, I have not seen it until well into the diagnostic. So I'm looking at all the capacitors. So I'll start identifying components here. These are the VRM. So this is our CPU, the rectangular boy. And let's just straighten the camera slightly. There we go. These are the VRMs, the voltage regulator modules. So what we have here. Uh, these are power stages. This is these are on semiconductor power stages, and they are um, a set of MOSFETs forming a buck regulator, and the drivers for those MOSFETs all in a single chip. So this is the kind of setup that you'll see on a high-end uh, buck regulator. The other thing that we've often seen in laptops that I've often showed off. Have we got one in here somewhere? Where's memory v core? Yes, memory V core is over here. So for the memory power here, we've got a pair of MOSFETs. And on the other side of the board, there is an inductor for those MOSFETs. So that is the normal regulators that I've shown off before. These guys are discrete power stages. So they are super exotic. They can do a lot more power handling than just a pair of MOSFETs can, which is why we've got fancy power stages down here. And I would imagine we've probably got them where is power? Oh, the powers, those, those are the ones for the GPU. So yeah, they're just kind of far away from it. But yeah, anyway, so power stage for the CPU. So we've got our power stages, inductor, capacitors, CPU. And then supplying these, um, we've got another bunch of small surface mount capacitors and resistors doing various things. So we want to check if any of those guys have gone nuclear. So we're looking for any of them that look darkened or missing or anything like that. And it all looks pretty good around there. Um, there are some marks on here. This is just uh, some liquid. You you might see a few droplets on this stuff. Like um, there was some stuff on the thermal pads that looks like water, but it's actually just a kind of oil that's come out of the thermal pads. So that's, that's why we've got what looks like liquid here. But that's normal. That's just like oil, oily residue, which is nothing to be concerned about. So this is uh, a GPU memory, so VRAM. This all looks fine. So yeah, without doing a full sweep of the entire board, there's our BIOS chip for something. That's the PCH, so that's probably the main BIOS for the system. Without doing a full systematic sweep of the board, this looks fine. I don't think we're going to see any visible damage. So I'm going to carry on. 
Good. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to check if we've got any short circuits through any of these MOS, any of these power stages. So let's go. Let's zoom out slightly. Now, by virtue of the fact that we've got half an ohm of resistance to ground, um, I'm already confident that there's nothing wrong with any of these. But we can check again anyway. So if I go, if I put my black probe onto the main power rail. And the main power rail is probably going to be on this capacitor here. Right, we'll check if that is on the main power rail because if it's a half an ohm to ground, then we know that's the main power rail. Uh, 0.9, can we get better probing on that? Yeah, well, it's still below an ohm. That's probably good enough. So if we use this as our reference point, so we'll go a black probe on that capacitor. And I'm going to check to the inductor, which is on the other side of the power stage. And as you can see, there's three and a half ohms. So that is not resistance through the power stage. The power stage is at high resistance. What we're seeing there is we're going, we've got a short to ground here. We're going into ground all the way through the ground plane, back through the CPU, back through the inductor to here. And the three and a half ohms we're seeing is through the CPU. So that's not shorted because we're going all the way back through ground through our short circuit to get there. So that is all good. If we saw zero ohms there, that would imply that we've got zero ohms going through that power stage. And that means that our CPU is probably dead or rather this power stage has gone short circuit. So what I'll do, I'll check the other ones as well. We will find that some of these will be common together. If we take a close look at the VRM setup here, you can see that we've got a power plane going along here and into the CPU. And have we got more over there? I think, yeah, we've got a couple more down there as well. So it looks like uh, all of these guys, so one, two, three, four, five, these are all common together to form a five phase or five VRMs going into the CPU. This guy here, You'll notice he's separate. He's got a slightly smaller inductor on him, and you can see a separation there. This is probably system agent, which is the second biggest power rail going into the CPU. So we'll check system agent as well. So once again, I'm going to go on my, my trusty shorted capacitor, and let's go to that inductor there. And we've got 20 ohms there. So again, this guy is also fine. So system agent, not shorted, no problem. Good. Right, let's give the same treatment to GPU vCore. So once again, we're going to go from our shorted capacitor to one of these guys. Doesn't matter which one. Again, they'll all be common. And we've got one ohm. So this is very low. However, GPUs are super low. But the important thing is our main short circuit is less than an ohm. Like we were at 0.6 at the, at the um, current sense resistor. So this is still well above that. Well, I say well above. It's nearly double. And that is good enough to give me reasonable belief that there's nothing wrong with these. So again, so far, we're saying that there's nothing wrong with any of this. What this means is that at this point, I can be reasonably assured that I'm clear to do voltage injection. We know that if we do voltage injection, we're not going to immediately sink that power into the CPU or the GPU which is what would concern me. Um, so what I'm going to do, we're going to voltage injection. We're going to hook up jumper wires. So let's get rigged up for jumper wires. So what we're going to do now is we're going to hook up jumper wires and I'm going to connect up a power supply that will put power into this shorted rail. And what will happen is because it's short circuited, the power that I inject will go straight through the short circuit and back to ground. This will cause whatever is shorted to start heating up as it conducts the, the current that I inject. So whatever is whatever has failed on this will start getting hot, which means that I can then find it and identify what has failed. So all the work we've done up until this point has been more or less just testing if we are ready to do power injection, because that's not a magic fix all. I've been doing these tests to see if power injection is probably going to work or not. And in this instance, as long as the board is not internally shorted, we should be good. So 
the first thing we need to do is we need to rig up some wires to inject power with. Um, now we're going to inject onto the main power rail and I'm going to do that from the current sense resistor over here. People have asked me before, why can't you just inject from the charger? Well, we can't inject on the charger because the inrush limiter keeps turning off because the power management chip is detecting a short. So we can't inject with the charger. So we have to put something in behind the inrush limiter so the, so the board cannot turn off that power. Uh, so that is why we're going to inject into the middle of the circuit board. The current sense resistor is a great place to go to because we know that that's behind the inrush limiter and it's also a nice big resistor that we can solder wires to. So I'm going to hook up jumper wires to that and then we'll set up our power supply. So now for the power supply, I'm going to use my Hammatech HM305P, which is a, a mid-range um, power supply for doing repair work with. There are cheaper options and there are more expensive options. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to set this down to 1 volt and uh, we're going to start at 3 amps. So once again, answering the question of why can't I use a phone charger or the laptop charger for this, the answer to that is that this is a regulated power supply. Uh, this is a regulated bench power supply. Now, a, a typical charger, like say your phone charger, is unregulated, which means it outputs a set, a set voltage, say five volts, and then it will supply up to its rated amps. But if it goes short circuit, it will attempt to deliver as many amps in current as it can until it physically dies. It will just burn itself out. By comparison, a regulated power supply like this, I can set the maximum current that we are allowed to deliver. I can set this value to be anywhere between, well, uh, milliamps or in this case up to 5.1 amps. And when it hits that threshold, the power supply will stop going any higher than that. So we can set this to 3 amps exactly and it will not go past 3 amps, which means this power supply can sit in a dead short circuit. Let me demonstrate. If I turn it on, we're now sitting at 1 volt, no amps. And if I short the, the crocodile clips out like that, as you can see, it's banged up to 3 amps and just stopped. Now our voltage has gone down to half a volt because the potential difference between negative and positive drops to zero because they're touching. The reason why it doesn't go to absolute zero is because there is some resistance in the fact that I'm just holding these. If I actually clench these crop clips together, we go even lower because there's a better connection and less resistance in the wires and the connection and so on. So this is why we need a bench power supply to do this kind of injection. There, you, don't, you can get smaller units than this. You can get little dinky things designed for this kind of thing. But this is the ideal tool for the job. And you can do all kinds of other things with bench power supplies as well. So. That's what we're going to be using. Let's go back to the board. Now, when we start injecting power and something gets hot, we need to find out what is getting hot. And in the past, I've done this just with the touchy-feely method, as I call it, where I just use the tips of my fingers to find the hot spot. However, this time around, I finally got myself a thermal camera. So this is a FLIR 1 thermal camera, and this is a phone attachment. So Type-C plugs into the bottom of your phone, and you can use the app on a phone to view the thermal camera. And this is more or less the cheapest way of getting a thermal camera to my knowledge. Short of using possibly like one of the cheap Chinese ones. I don't know how good they are. At any rate, this is what I've tried. It's okay. In my experimentation with it, I found it to be a bit temperamental. However, despite having had this thing for like six months, I still haven't actually used it in anger yet. So let's see how that goes this time round. So I'm going to go ahead and plug it into my phone. And the problem I have with my phone is it works when it feels like it. It needs to pop up with a prompt saying, allow the app to use the device. And the prompt just doesn't come up and you get stuck on this screen. So yeah, I've had mixed results. Some other devices I've tested this on have been okay. This phone, which is a Huawei P20, seems to be particularly bad for it. So yeah, again, it's 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 not doing it. This is very frustrating.
There we go. All right. So this is going to be kind of janky to show you guys with a camera looking at a camera looking at a board. But as you can see, we now have actual real thermal imaging. And when uh, when I move my hand away, we're getting a very ambient thing. And when something hot comes into view, like my hand, which is at about 31 degrees, then we get a big old hot spot. And again, you know, if I take my hand and I press it down against the table there, we get a slight ghost image behind where I've warmed up the table slightly with my hand. So that's kind of cool. So as you can see, it's the real deal. It's not some stupid phone app. So now this thing is actually on and working. Let's hook up our jumper wires and get to injection. Right, power on. 1 volt and 3 amps. Now you'll notice that we're already up to 0.9 of a volt and that's because we were only just under an ohm of resistance which is a little bit on the high side so that concerns me slightly. However we are still putting in 2.7 watts of power so I think we may still work. So let's see if anything is showing up yet. Oh hello. What's that? Something is just immediately lighting up on the board. Is that a reflection or is that something heating up? Heck, I've got to avoid drifting off shot. Okay, well, looking at the rest of the board here, you can see that it's pretty mediocre. If I put my hand into view there as a reference, the board is cold. But over there, something is heating up, something's flaring. It's not particularly warm to my finger touch. So if that's actually it, then man, this thermal camera works like a charm if that's actually it. I'm just going to turn the board over and see if there's anything hot on the other side. There's another capacitor there, so that might be it as well. Yeah, I think that boy's hot. It's really hard to tell. It would have taken me a long time to find that with the touchy-feely method. But with the thermal camera, that just lit up like a Christmas tree. I couldn't have hoped for a better example. Magic. So as you can see, the thermal camera, it's not told me exactly which device it is, but it's just put a big old target on the board around there. So I know it's probably that capacitor or the one on the other side, or something very close by. So yeah, very cool. Right, let's turn that off for a sec, because I think that's proven its point now. Let's take a closer look at what is actually getting hot down here. So that capacitor, that looks pretty normal, this guy here. It doesn't feel hot, it's not burning my finger. Neither is that I see. So what about the capacitor that was on the other side of the board in that spot? Which is that guy there. Again, that... I like to... Th I feel like there's some heat there, but... Oh, yeah, just about. It's really subtle, though. If I pump four amps into that, it might go nuclear. However... I feel like we've found it and we've managed to find it at a relatively low power level as well. So let's take both those capacitors off and see which one of them is shorted. And with a bit of luck, we may have been able to find this without having to dump four amps into the board, which is very cool. Power supply off. So I'll put black probe on ground. So one side of this, this side is going to be ground anyway, because capacitors nine times out of ten go to ground. 1.2 ohms. Hmm. Okay, and the other side? 1.2 ohms. Fine. Well, it's certainly shorted. So again, if I touch both sides of that, we get 1 ohm. So what about the capacitor on the other side? Is that going to tell us any different? Yeah, same deal. Again, there's our 1-ish ohm short. Fine. So, because these are in circuit, we can't tell which one it is, because both of them have got ground on both sides, because the power rail is shorted to ground. 
So we need to take these off of the board to actually determine which one has failed. Because we're very close to uh, back plates and heat sinks and stuff, I'm just going to wet both sides of these capacitors with some fresh solder, which will lower the melting point of the solder and make them easier to remove. Some hot tweezers would be lovely right now, but I don't have hot tweezers. I do have hot air though. So under normal conditions, a capacitor should start initially at low resistance and then very quickly go sky high in resistance because a capacitor absorbs charge and then releases it. So when we start putting power into it with the multimeter, initially it will be low resistance as it soaks up energy and then it will go high resistance as it stops absorbing energy. So what you sometimes with capacitors you can get momentarily a very quick blip of what looks like a short circuit and then it quickly seems to disappear that's just because it's a capacitor just just going and just charging up so it's a lot like putting a sponge in water actually you put a sponge in water initially it all the water will just go into the sponge and then it'll stop absorbing so let's see what this one says uh this is going to be tough Huh. We have a shorted capacitor at half an ohm. That guy's dead. So what about this one? Whoops. And that one, as you can see, we have kilo ohms and rising. So it's absorbing power and the resistance is building up as it absorbs power. So that one is behaving as you would expect and this one is dead short circuit. That's our dead capacitor. So what we should now find, let's put the dead one there and the live one over there because we'll take a closer look at that in a moment. Meanwhile, back on the motherboard, if I check between ground and the current sense resistor and we are no longer shorted to ground, we've got 100,000 ohms and rising. And it's rising because there's capacitors absorbing power. There's a lot of capacitance on this rail. So there we go. So if we put this board back in the laptop now, it's going to turn on and it's going to work. Um, but in an ideal world, we kind of want to replace those capacitors if we can. So let's take a closer look. Right, let's see what this thing is. So uh, this is what's called an MLCC capacitor. So that's a multi-layer ceramic capacitor. Um, these things, uh, they will have a capacitance and a voltage, which is what we care about. The voltage on it is probably going to be about 50 volts because MLCCs have got a pretty high voltage rating on them and they're all roughly the same. Um, generally speaking, the big boys, um, the big guys will have a high, a high voltage on them like 50 volts and the tiny little ones will be down at, uh, at like sort of 30, 20 or 15 or something like that so either way the replacement ones are all going to be 50 volt rated and this is on a 19 volt rail so basically if we stick in a 50 volt rated mlcc it will be fine and the thing about capacitors to remember is that they charge up to the voltage you charge them to if you put a 50 volt capacitor on a 19 volt rail it will charge to 19 volts uh, and um, so the only thing is you need to make sure that it that the charge you're putting into it does not exceed its rating. So if we put a tw if we put a 10 volt capacitor on a 19 volt rail, it's going to blow up. So we don't need to get an exact 19 volt capacitor here. It just has to be able to withstand what we're putting into it. So 50 volts is completely fine. We do need to know the capacitance though. So I'll put my multimeter into capacitance mode. Here we go, farads. And let's see what this thing is. Ooh. Uh. Damn it. Watch me fling this thing into the other side of the room. I've got a better tool for this, but I'm trying to show you on a multimeter because that's something that you guys are more likely to have lying around. 
There we go. So that is 11.5 microfarads. So that's going to be a 10 microfarad capacitor. Capacitors have like 20% tolerances on them. They're never exact. So generally speaking with capacitors, in the vast majority of cases, you only have to be in within the correct order of magnitude and it will do the job. Um, if you're on very, very sensitive things and you're working in like uh, analog or audio or um, radio circuits and stuff like that, it's kind of more important. However, for power capacitors, as long as you're in the correct, the right order of magnitude, you're fine. So that was coming up at about 11 and a half and it's intended to be a 10 microfarad capacitor. So our dead capacitor may also be a 10 microfarad, but because it's on the same section of the board, it's on the same circuit, I think it might be something else because when you find MLCCs together, there's often a selection there. They'll have several decoupling capacitors that cover a range of capacitances to cover a range of frequencies that it's filtering. So if we have a look again, if we use the, um, the VRMs as an example, you'll notice that there's a smattering of capacitors on each VRM there. But some of them will just be filtering capacitors and they'll be, for example, a 1 microfarad, a 10 microfarad and a 100 microfarad, for example. So on the board here, we had a 10 microfarad on one side, but the dead one from the other side, it could well be a 100 microfarad or it might be, you know, a, a 1 picofarad, a 10 picofarad or something like that. Even though it's the same size, it might not be identical. So just to be safe, I'm going to track down a schematic for this board. So this board is an LAE994P. And I Google searched for LAE994P schematic. And I came up with a couple of results that said that it was difficult to find one. However, I also found one chap who very helpfully said that the E993P is basically the same. And I have got a schematic for an LA993P. And here it is. So what we're going to do now is find the circuit that these capacitors are from. Now, if we look at the board here, it says here PU18V00. So PU18 is that little chip there, which is what this capacitor is on. So if we find that on the schematic, we're going to find those capacitors nearby. So let's go to PU18V00 and see what we can find. Right, and here we are. I should open this in uh, uh, Adobe Reader, to be honest. It's a bit easier to find stuff. So what, it, what is this? What are we looking at here? 1.8 volt, 1.8 VSP. Not sure what that is off the top of my head. It's a 1.8 volt rail. No, not really sure what VSP stands for, but it doesn't really matter in this instance. So what we want to know is what those capacitors are. So uh, let's see, what are we connected to? So we've got two capacitors on the input here. Here we go, B+. Plus. That's the main power rail coming into the laptop. So the main power rail into the laptop, there's two bypass capacitors, and then we go into the chip. And if you look, We've got like one, two, three, four pins on the chip, which count as this power input. And that tallies with the big old trace that we saw on top of the chip. So these two capacitors here, these are going to be our guys. These are the ones that we're looking at. So let's zoom in on those. And they are 25 volt capacitors. They're both 0805, which is the size. And they're both 10U, which will be 10 microfarads because the micro symbol is like a U, so you'll often see UF. It's actually micro. So they're both 10 microfarad capacitors. So we actually could have taken a guess that because one of them was a 10 mic, the other also would be a 10 mic. But it was worth checking anyway. But this kind of goes to show that more often than not, if you take a guess, you can probably get lucky most of the time. But I'm not going to say that I recommend that. Finding a schematic and getting the actual measurement is always better if you can. In any case, I need a 10 microfarad capacitor. So let me go to my capacitary. So let's have a rummage through my capacitors here. So this is a capacitor selection pack that I bought on eBay. And it's got lots and lots of different SMD capacitors in it, most of which I will never ever use. However, whatever I come across, I probably have one. And this pack of capacitors 
This was, I can't remember how much, it was less than $10, I think, you know. It's a very cheap way of getting a bunch of capacitors when you don't know what you need. So these are all labelled on the back with a number. So, um, oh wow, I've put all of these the wrong way up. Here's an example. So these ones say 103. That means 10 and 3 zeros. Uh, so this is our rating. Now we're looking for 10 micros. So um, this is measured in picofarads. So this would be 10,000 picofarads. And that, I think, is 10 nanofarads. Uh, so we want a 106, which is 10 and 6 zeros, which would be 10 microfarads. So I need to find the 106 rating. 102. There's going to be a lot of uh, wrong ones here. Here we go, 106. That didn't take long. As you can see, I've used a couple of these ones already. That's a giveaway as to which one was the correct option. So now we're going to hot air our new capacitor and the other one that was still working onto the board. So I've brought my airflow right down now so we don't blow these away. Now, I'm going to put some uh, flux on the board as well. The flux makes sure that we get a nice good join and it's also handy because it helps locate things in place. It adds just a little bit of um, goop that stops you from blowing things away. So let's go into there. And I'm still blowing it away. There we go, that's that one done. Now the other side. Now I'll just use the soldering iron just to touch up both sides, just to tidy that up slightly. Just remove those blobby bits we've got on the end. I always get little tails on mine. I'm not very good at removing those. I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments how to get rid of those tails a bit more effectively. And I'm sure half the answers will be more flux as well. There we go. All right, that's that done. And once again, with both of the capacitors back on the board, we'll just do another short check and we can verify that we still are not shorted ground. So you can see the multimeter cycled a couple of times where it went from low resistance to high resistance. And now we're sitting up in the mega ohms. So that's millions of ohms. Brilliant! So, let's remove our jumper leads and we're basically going to reassemble the laptop now. I'm not tightening these screws down yet, I'm just picking up the threads just to locate the heatsink in place. Then I'm going to get the fan wires sorted on the other side. And as soon as I know that everything is nice and lined up, then we'll tighten all of this up. You don't need to be quite so fussy with simple heat sinks that you get on most laptops, but if it's a big complicated heat sink like this one, it's best to make sure that everything is just right before you commit. And that should be fine. Right, the back panel is still off, but we're together enough to do a test run. So, charger is here, the light is on, plug it in. And the light is still on. You can just see that on camera, and if I push the power button... Sign of life light, caps lock LED is on, which is what modern Dells do. Cool. 
Come on, please be ram training. That's sitting on max fan and no display output for quite a long time. I think it turned off. It's trying again. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm just going to turn it on again and just give it a third attempt at a post. It did one power cycle there. So that was, it did attempt one, attempt two. Here's attempt three. Turned off. It turned off. Okay. Attempt four. Ah, there it goes. God, that went kicking and screaming. Time and day not set. Please run setup program. My dude, that's fine with me. We are WinRa. Right, let's turn that off. Right, very good example on why you sometimes should give it several tries before you say, no, that's not working. Because, like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, sometimes when you're looking at something, you're like, that's dead, it's not going to post. But there are other times where I'm just like, no, this thing is ready to go. This thing wants to start. It just needs to try a couple of times. So I've sometimes referred to things as RAM training, uh, which means it is detecting what RAM is installed and what speeds it can run at. And I have suspicion that that was RAM training messing us about there. So let's put this back, uh, this back piece back on. So the battle is fought and the war is won. Um, that one was a bit of a journey um, because I went into a lot of detail. So I'm hoping that was appreciated and uh, helpful to people. But I feel like we got some really good demonstrations out in that one. So uh, this is all fixed now. We had a shorted capacitor on uh, one of the secondary power rails. In this case, a 1.35 volt uh, power rail. Uh, we found it, we replaced it, and now the laptop is good to go. So thank you everyone for watching. Um, my support links for my um, Patreon, my Discord server, and also my Twitter and Instagram are down in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button because it tells YouTube that you like this content and it helps me out as well. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you very much and bye for now.